Hi everyone, this is Sydney, and I'm going to be telling you about Hodvige. Hodvige was a Flemish Beguine in the 13th century, who we don't really know much about other than what we can tell from the recordings of her visions, her letters, and her poetry. It is believed that she was most likely from a higher class, because she often references chivalry and courtly love in her writing, and we also believe that she was probably educated because her writing demonstrates a knowledge of the Latin language, the rules of rhetoric, the theory of music, and quite a few other things. We know that she led a small group of Beguines later in her life, but was most likely exiled from the Beguines. Um, and some even believe that she was arrested or executed on the charge of heresy by the Inquisition. Now, the Beguines were more of a movement than they were a religious order. They were these devout women who wanted to live together and practice their faith in this very nun-like way, but they didn't want to be connected with any men. They didn't want to be connected with the monks. In the introduction of Hodvige the Complete Works, Mother Columba Hart describes the Beguines as having, quote, rejected not only the narrow life of the lady in the castle, but the strict obligations of the nun in the cloister, unquote. So the Beguines had pretty flexible control over their religious practice. They had to recite the hours, but outside of that, they could teach or learn anything that they wanted to. Uh, we know that they educated both the poor and the financially stable, they cared for the sick and the outcast, and they provided shelter for widows and single women who were often the subjects of abuse. So those are the kinds of things that Hodvich was committed to doing as she wrote her poetry and received her visions. And she also believed that it was her calling to share with the Beguines, especially the younger ones when she led them, her understanding of religion and spirituality. As I said, Hodvich lived in the 13th century, which was a time like so many others when women were treated extremely poorly. It was completely okay for a husband to beat his wife if she, had, if she had disobeyed him, and it was widely believed by churches and society that women needed men to work as this sort of middleman between her and God, that women needed men to oversee and guide their relationship with God, and that if women didn't have a man to do that, she was most likely going to be overtaken by these religious energies and become ecstatic, heretic, among other things. So the Beguines kind of took this belief that women would go crazy if they were allowed to be f to freely practice their faith and embraced it. The Beguines were a movement of women who communed together and ultimately challenged this policing of women and their faith. This is a little bit of an aside, but I think it helps with perspective. Um, this idea of men needing to police women and their faith would continue into, or at least also be seen in the 19th century. I wrote a paper about Jane Eyre, and this idea that women needed men to regulate their faith was still very prevalent at the time of Jane Eyre's publication. My thesis for this paper was basically that Bronte was simultaneously disputing the limitations of faith that were put onto women by the church, while also offering a more feminine and caring side of religion that women may not have known they were capable of experiencing on their own. I think Hodfeech does a very similar thing with her poetry. Her use of female pronouns in her poetry is not done as literally as it is in modern times, um, and instead is most likely for the benefit of the younger Beguines that she's writing for. It is to show them that 
their religious experience with God is as natural and also as, quote, other as a man's experience. Like I said, the Beguines embrace this sort of, quote, wild version of female faith, and I use the term wild very endearingly, and it is this version of female faith that sparked the love mysticism movement, of which Havich was a major, if not the major, influence. Love mysticism was a predominantly female movement and portrayed relationships with God as being a love relationship. Love mysticism was extremely emotional, and the relationship with capital L love, meaning God, was one that, quote, throws the minds and senses of these persons into commotion. The experience of oneness and love must go hand in hand with a psychological withdrawal from the self that usually finds its reactions in visions. And that's a quote from Paul Maumers in Hodvich the Complete Works. So in her poetry, which is what I'm going to be focusing on, Hodvich mostly writes about a very specific type of love as a spiritual experience one feels with God. She uses several themes in her work, such as nature and the seasons, courtly love, but it's this paradoxical love that is really in all of her poetry and that I find the most interesting. This paradoxical love that she describes is the type of love that you lose yourself in, where you're so in love with this other person, this other being, that you kind of become detached from yourself, like it completely consumes you and eventually turns into what is, or at least what feels like, madness. But at the same time, as much as this feeling can be excruciating and frustrating, it's also like amazing and exhilarating. The devotion and power of this love that is eternal but can never be satiated is a riveting experience and one that Hodvich is really captivated by. It's a bit hard to describe this feeling, so I'm going to read you some of her poetry so you can hopefully get a, a better idea of this type of feminine faith that she's trying to portray to these younger begins. So first I'm going to read stanzas two and three from her poem, Love's Mode of Action. Valiant souls who have come so far that they endure unsatisfied love shall in all ways, toward her, be bold and undaunted, and ever ready to receive, be it consolation, be it blows, from love's mode of action. Love's way of acting is unheard of, as anyone who has experienced it well knows, for love withdraws consolation midway. He whom love touches cannot hold out, he tastes many nameless hours. The next is stanza 5 from Conquest of Love at a Price. Love makes me wander outside myself. Where shall I find something of love according to my heart's delight, so that I may sweeten my pain? Although I follow her, she flies. Although I attend her school, she will not agree with me in anything. In a moment, this becomes all too clear to me. Alas, I speak from heart's distress. My misfortune is too great, and for me, to do without love is a death, since I cannot have fruition of her. So we see in these excerpts of two of her poems how this paradoxical love comes into play in her version of faith. The speaker of the poems has an immense love and desire for God, whom Havich refers to as love, so much that it hurts, but as much as love gives to the speaker, they also withdraw, and that's something that the speaker has to come to terms with. I'm also going to read from Nothingness and Love. This is stanza six. Concerning love, we can relate many a wonder of what the work of her wonder is. On one adroitly tries her tricks, saying, I am all yours and you are all mine. On another, she rushes so swiftly that she touches him and breaks his heart. Still another, she leaves entirely free of her, thus she can throw us off the scent and bring us back again. The speaker in her poems is always wanting 
please love, but they can't always do so. They're not always aware of love's whereabouts. Sometimes they're in favor with love and sometimes they're hurt by her. A relationship with love is very much like the courtly relationship of a maiden and a knight. The maiden, who is love in this case, is the one who holds all the power, who is in control of the game of courtship. And it's Hodvich, the knight, who really has to try and keep up. I think Hodvich's poetry, especially her poems, Unloved by Love and Nothingness in Love, are so powerful for people, and especially women of faith, because she shows how complicated and imperfect, but also how beautiful a relationship with the divine can be, which is pretty unique for the time. She really gave the Beguines this version of faith that is not withheld by a man, and is not policed by a man, and that is completely okay in how maddening it was, but also how beautiful it was. I would definitely recommend reading her work. She has about 45 Sanzaic poems, and then she also has couplet poems, and I would definitely recommend reading them. I think that she's amazing both as a woman, as a writer, and as a woman in faith, and I hope you enjoyed listening to me talk about her.